our bodies are kind of like cars. You put gas into a car and it goes. It needs the gas in order to have the energy to do its job. And our bodies are like that with glucose. Glucose it gives us the energy we need to do our tasks and keep our bodies functioning. And just like when things break down with a car, too much glucose or too little glucose can cause some devastating effects on our body. Today, we're gonna to be talking about glucose regulation. We're gonna be using Giddens chapter 15 for this lesson. We're gonna be completing concept study guide version B. We'll be defining and describing the concept, talking about risk factors, noticing signs and symptoms of both high or low glucose, and talking about both nursing and collaborative, collaborative interventions. So let's start as always by defining and describing the concept of glucose regulation. So the definition of this concept is that glucose regulation is the process of maintaining optimal glucose levels for our body, just like Goldilocks, not too high and not too low, but just right. And ultimately the end result and the goal of glucose metabolism is that the glucose gives our cells the energy it needs for life. The scope of this concept ranges from low glycemia to high glycemia and normal glycemia. So euglycemia means normal, anywhere from 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. Hypoglycemia is anything less than 70 and hyperglycemia is anything greater than 140. Now, some places will say more of less than 60. Uh, so that's going to be institution specific, but this is what our Giddens text says. Now it's the endocrine system in our body that's really most responsible for glucose regulation. And that includes the pituitary gland, the pancreas, the adrenals, and the posterior pituitary gland. There's two videos linked in the description box below that give a really nice understanding of how glucose works in our body and why we need it. So pause here, click on those two links below and I'll see you back here in a minute. So we understand that cells need glucose in the cells in order to make and use energy, but we have to get the glucose from the bloodstream into the cell itself. And the key that we use to unlock the cells and open the door is called insulin. Insulin is a hormone that unlocks the cells, opens the cells up so glucose can enter the cells and the cells can use them. Insulin is the mediator that moves glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. There's two other hormones we need to discuss, glucagon and cortisol, and they work the opposite of insulin. The, the glucagon and cortisol are going to help raise glucose levels in the bloodstream, uh, especially when we either are low in blood sugar and need more in our bloodstream, or we're under stress and the body uh, recognizes that we need additional blood sugar to deal with whatever stressful situation is going on. Now, as in most things that we talk about, the goal is homeostasis, finding that perfect sweet spot of euglycemia. And the problems arise when these hormones get out of balance, either too low or too high, uh, or when the production of these hormones is not equal with the amount of glucose that is needed. And when these problems arise, there's two different variations that we're going to see low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, is a state of insufficient or low blood glucose levels defined as less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. So low is less than 70. And hyper, hyper means high, glycemia is going to be a, a blood glucose um, more than 100 and a fasting state, meaning you haven't eaten in the last eight hours, or more than 140 when not fasting. And so when these uh, levels become unbalanced, we're going to either have this hyper or hypoglycemia. And in terms of hyperglycemia, elevated blood glucose levels greater than 140 when not fasting are gonna have both short and long-term consequences. Now, in terms of short-term consequence, we may see something like dehydration. And that's because the, the kidneys are going to help try to um, urinate more, create more urine, patient will be peeing more. And the reason is we can uh, filter out glucose through those kidneys. And it's one way that the body tries to get rid of excess glucose. But if you're making more urine and um, voiding more often and with more frequency, we're going to have more dehydration. 
Now there's both other long-term consequences from extended periods of hyperglycemia, both in the end organ disease, such as damage to the nerves, uh, retinopathy and neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, nerve damage and, and damage to the um, retinas of the eyes, so blindness and um, cardiovascular problems like hypertension and cardiovascular disease that's caused by the narrowing of these um, blood vessels over time that's caused by the amount of glucose just floating around in the bloodstream. So over time, hyperglycemia can damage your kidneys. It can cause nerve damage. It can cause blindness. It can cause uh, all, all sorts of cardiac disease like hypertension on um, coronary artery disease. So it has significant devastating effects to many organs in the body. Like we just mentioned, here are some of those complications of hyperglycemia. You can pause here to review this yourself. Now, when we're talking about hypoglycemia, low glycemic uh, blood sugar levels, we're not talking about short-term and long-term consequences because quite frankly, we can't live long-term with chronic hypoglycemia. We just wouldn't have the energy that the cells need to live. But hypoglycemia in the short term is going to manifest in these kinds of symptoms, nervousness, irritability, sweating, diaphoresis, anxiety, heart palpitations, neurologic changes, especially like altered mental status and not quite as with it, seizures, unconsciousness, and even death if left unchecked. Because again, our bodies need energy from glucose in the cells for life to be sustained. And now here's an example of low blood sugar and the effects that that has on the body. So to go ahead and pause here and review this for yourself as well. So let's talk about which patients, both in populations and in individuals, are at risk for having impaired glucose regulation. Some of the risk factors for impaired glucose regulation are going to include age. Uh, as you age, your impairment, your risk for impairment increases. Pregnancy uh, changes many different hormones in the body and increases risk. Certain racial and ethnic groups are at higher risk for having problems with glyce uh, glycemic control. Your Giddens text specifically lists, lists um, American Indians or Native Americans, Alaska Natives, African Americans, um, Hispanic and Latinos. Um, and Asian Americans are at higher risk compared to Caucasian Americans. Now, also things like genetics certainly play a factor into this. So if you have a family history of, high, of diabetes, for example, it puts you at higher risk. Um, and then lifestyle, diet and exercise, as many things we talk about, increase your risk for problems with like diabetes. Certain medications can also change hormones like cortisol and can lead to having problems with glucose control as well. 